I want to kind of start off where you just finished, which was about the UK's role and 0.7. It is, of course, a real disgrace that we have turned it into not only 0.5, but we've turned it into a cap rather than a floor. 0.7 was always an aspiration to meet and then go beyond. Mm -hmm. And now 0.5 is a cap. So if the government spends in other departments things that could be aid, it reduces the development, uh, uh, overseas development budget. Uh, and so that's, I mean, that's what you're referring to when you're talking about us spending on Ukrainians, on, on the housing costs, that comes out. Every time we spend housing costs on Ukrainians, the right thing to do perfectly, that comes out of the budget for overseas uh, development directly from that department. Um, uh, and so that, I think, is it's not even 0.5 target anymore. It is a kind of, um, we will always spend under 0.5. It is even worse. And why is that important when we talk about freedom of religion um, and belief? It's because I would put it to you that there are malign actors in religion and belief and development around the world. And I think you see those actors both coming from Saudi Arabia, you see those actors coming from the USA. They are people who often will attach certain religion and belief criteria to their development. Now, I saw this in Kosovo. I worked in Kosovo after the war there, where, um, where Saudi Arabia was very determined to put money in about building the mosques uh, and the certain religious infrastructure that they thought was acceptable. Well, Kosovo's um, population was never a highly religious population, just like Britain, actually. Even in Victorian era, never more than a third of the people regularly attended church. Britain is a relatively secular, non-religious country in terms of actively religious, but we are culturally religious. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and actually, uh, Kosovo was a very similar kind of country in its, its Islam. It was you know, kind of culturally Islamic, but actively it was not. But the aid and development there was attached very much to building up structures of trying to uh, replicate, in that case, more Wahhabi kind of Islam, which is a particularly nasty and uh, aggressive kind of, I would call it a militant uh, version of Islam. Nothing wrong with that if you want to have that as your own belief, but that was not the basis of belief in Kosovo at the time, or, or really now even. But there was a deliberate act, and there continues to be that around the world. Um, particularly from the Gulf states trying to impose their views. Or we can look at, for example, the role of the evangelical church in America, putting a lot of development aid into parts of Africa, where it comes with strings attached. It comes with strings attached of trying to have to, you have to worship the kind of religion that they are imposing, rather than your uh, um, domination of it. Um, and, of course, it comes with, particularly in the fight of AIDS, and I touched on this at, um, in the World AIDS Day debate, in Uganda, you've seen a real rolling back of the provision of condoms, the provision of um, being able to teach about the, the truth about HIV and, it's, uh, and the way it's uh, passed on, because the evangelical church is trying to impose its doctrine. And there is what I would describe a neo-colonialism, a neo-colonialism in some actors, now, Britain is not immune to this. Most, uh, or no, sorry, I should say, a lot of religious intolerance and LGBT intolerance and intolerance against women and intolerance against minorities is from Britain itself. You know, we did it in the first wave of colonial and imperialism, so let's not confuse that. You know, most countries were more liberal before Britain arrived. Most countries had more ethnic and religious diversity living side by side before Britain arrived. Most countries accepted more LGBT, gay people, lesbians, etc. in their communities, not with those labels, but in their communities just living before Britain arrived and regulated religion, regulated sexuality, regulated gender. So let's be honest, Britain had a very poor role in that. But I think Britain, we have the great British story is that we get a lot of things wrong but hopefully we see pretty soon and we try and correct that. Slavery is a good example. We were the leading force of it. We got it wrong, but we were also the leading force of the abolitionists. We see the, uh, of our ways. I think that is the great British story. Um, we should not be wedded to, to that, but we move forward and we are progressive. And with religion and belief and development, I think it is similar. We know the error of our previous ways, and it is therefore almost our duty to make sure we plough in money to development and aid that does not come with strings attached about 
what you believe, what faith you must worship, or even cultural norms to say, our norm in Britain is that you must be uh, X, and so you must follow that. But actually, the development aid from DFID, and now FCDO, but originally with DFID, because that was the pinnacle, was very much about community-centred aid that actually looked at and tried to find those different intersectionalities, and particularly those intersectionalities that include religion, culture, and political belief which I would describe as the kind of three arms of the same, the same thing, really. You know, kind of, and very often, if you see one attacked, actually you'll see the others attacked as well. You know, kind of, very often in, you know, kind of, in places where they are enforcing a political doctrine, they are also enforcing a doctrine around religion. Or in places where you are enforcing a cultural doctrine, you are actually enforcing a certain kind of, um, denying a certain kind of faith. And we see that in Iran, do we not? Where both the Baha'i uh, particularly have been harmed over generations, um, but also uh, an area that I work very much with because I'm the uh, chair of the All Party Group for the Kurds. And we see that the Kurds are of multi faith. Usually, faith is not vitally important to them as their core identity, their linguistic and cultural identity is. But there is a common belief in terms of a Kurdish history, a Kurdish common thread, a Kurdish culture, and a kind of a moderate, a moderate Islam. And you see in Iran how, for example, it was the Kurds that started some of the real protests there of the women refusing to wear the headscarf because of a, of, a, of a feeling that the enforcement of a, um, of a for want of a, a, a better word, a totalitarian kind of understanding of religion, and, and again, I think it's about religion and politics, because the Iranian system is political as much religious, so I always think it's important to, it's not just a religious doctrine. And so British aid and development becomes even more important there. But it does mean that we need to also, as I said, the great British story is we get things wrong, but we see it and we correct it. So where do we continue to need to correct? Well, actually, at home, we need to understand the role that Islamophobia plays in our understanding at home, but also abroad. You know, how, does, how do we pull the strings and the heartstrings of aid uh, and charity collections when it is Christian communities uh, or whether it, when it is um, Jewish communities compared to when it is um, Muslim communities. And there is a difference uh, there, and there is a difference. Uh, when I say Muslim communities, I don't also just, I probably mean communities that lay people in Britain would incorrectly describe as Muslim communities because it is also perception. Uh, uh, and that has been much worse after, of course, the war on terror and 9-11, but it has not gone away. Um, and, and those prejudices also relate into then how the British public wish to focus on poverty alleviation and aid and development. And it is not something that we should, we should stop being critical of ourselves, but also understand that through that critical endeavour, that is how you make yourself better and you make, yourself, um, you make, your, you make your, um, your aid and development uh, uh, more, uh, more important. And then finally, I wanted to say, I used to sit on the Council of Europe um, uh, Joint Committee, and we, uh, this was probably about 10 years ago now, and we launched the No Hate um, uh, campaign, maybe even more than 10 years ago now. I can remember seeing all the designs, working out what logo we wanted and all that kind of thing, but it seems like only yesterday that we were in some drafty hall in, um, in, in Strasbourg and then in, Brus in, in, in Budapest, actually, because we have a fantastic youth centre in Budapest. Um, that I would recommend anyone goes to while it's still there and why all bands still allows it to exist. Um, but uh, there, that campaign, um, uh, I think, was also really important because it was a campaign to try and link people together. And it was, to me, that the Sustainable Development Goals came afterwards, but it was the same basis of what we then developed with the Sustainable Development Goals. And that was a basis of saying, aid is not something that you do to on others, Hate speech is not just something that happens in these horrible dark corners. It happens everywhere in all of our communities. And we have a common cause to stamp out hate speech here as we do to stamp out hate speech 
elsewhere. And that also is the principle of those sustainable development goals, that we have a, a lot to do here in Britain to fulfill development, to combat poverty, to make sure, you know, because you know, the reality is that we have a, a awful levels of poverty, awful levels of intersectional discrimination. But to run a campaign that also speaks to people and their intersectional um, discrimination and disadvantage in other countries and in other areas, and so you make common cause. And you say, we understand that there is discrimination happening here in Pakistan or here in India, or as well as in Britain, as well as in China, as well as in Uganda. And through that common cause and endeavor, you create, I think, a better development and a more stable set of anti-poverty measures.